Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. Hello, everybody. We're talking with Dr. Harry Leiter. Hello, uh, Dr. Leiter. Larry, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, please feel free to call me Harry. The the single person who cares most in this world that I be called doctor consistently is my Jewish mother. But since I can placate her, you can call me Harry. Okay. Yes. I'm sure she'd be interesting to have on sometimes. Uh, yeah, she uh, takes a lot of credit for my success, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> and she, I'm sure she should. So, Harry, tell me where you are. When we talked in the past, you were living in Lauderdale. Are you still in Lauderdale? I am in Lauderdale. I'm not from there. I grew up and went to medical school in Philly. Big Philadelphia Eagles fan, so it's a good year for us. But I've lived in, because of my training and career, I've lived in seven cities. But the last few years, I've been in Florida, first in Sarasota, and now more recently to take on a new job. I'm in the uh, Fort Lauderdale area. Yeah, and so when uh, getting back for... uh the podcast today, you had to fight that. Uh, I assume you're coming from headquarters over there or coming up from Miami. Yeah, yeah. My company's headquarters are at no, uh, a university called Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. And a lot of the snowbirds are getting back to Florida this time yeah. of year. Traffic is just exploding down here right now. It is not going to be no. any better. It's only going to get worse, yeah, unfortunately. Exactly. But congratulations for fighting your way through it, getting back so we can do this. Oh, sure. I was looking forward to this all day. I've been uh, wanting to uh, have you on because looking at your resume, Harry, it just blows my mind. You live your life day to day, week to week, month to month, and I'm sure you don't look back and maybe see it the way I see it. But I mean, you've crammed a whole lot into 25 years. <laughs> well, you know I'd, like, I'd like to say I had a grand plan, but actually it was a little more organic that I went from one uh, opportunity or something I really had passion around to another. But the big idea was I realized early in my career when I was in med school that as much as I liked taking care, I'm an internist, by the way, a general right. internist, much okay. as I like taking care of patients one by one, you can only really touch in any one year, maybe 500 or 600 people. Yeah. Uh, right. But the big idea that got me excited was how do you create programs and services or products that could move the needle and help millions of people? Yeah. We used to call that disease management when I started it this years ago. Now we call it population health. But my passion has always been working for an organization that can move the needle at scale and help millions of people live healthier lives or stay well. So right from the start, you were somebody who looked beyond what you were doing day to day, and you were looking beyond that, like, how can we mushroom, how can we origami this out and have a bigger impact? You know, yeah, and those, yeah. Yeah, that's I, the kind I, of I, thinking, I, Harry, I'm, you know, that you've run into because you're thinking that way over your career. Where did that come from? Why'd you go? How did your mother get you to go to <laughs> that school? <laughs> well, it's actually the reverse. So I went to Penn State University. I'm a Nittany Lion. And Larry, I went from being a pretty introverted, kind of almost nerdy guy. By the way, being nerdy today is a cool thing, my daughter's yeah, telling me. Right. Yeah. When, I, when you and I were growing up, being nerdy right. was not cool. Wow. Wow. But anyway, I was a pretty nerdy high school kid. And when I got to college, I blossomed, Larry, and I started getting involved in leadership activities student government, and I was president of my fraternity, and I was involved with a lot of leadership stuff, and it turned me on. And what turned me on was not the prestige of it, but the idea of building teams and getting people to work together to achieve a bigger goal. Yeah, And I actually thought about going to law school, because I thought maybe I'll go into politics or something. And my father always wanted to be a doctor. He was an engineer, and he worked for Xerox as a sales manager. And he said, Harry, I'll support whatever you want to do, but I don't think you understand what law is really about. So he he insisted I interview three attorneys to ask them how they feel about law. Ah. And I did that, and they all said it was kind of boring. You know, it was yeah. going through documents and briefs and filings. It wasn't what you see on TV. It's not courtroom drama. So I ended up going to med school despite my interest in leadership. And then I 
put all that leadership stuff on the back burner for a number of years where I got my medical degree, yeah. um, internal medicine training. And then I got into a very, very exclusive fellowship program called the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. Johnson & Johnson, one of the heirs, the grandsons, put millions of dollars into a healthcare nonprofit. And they funded, one thing they did was they funded 25 doctors a year after they're done all their medical training to go to one of five universities and get trained in public health. And they would fund you to get another degree like a master's of public health or an MBA. So I got into that, was very blessed. I got into that very exclusive program and I was able to have this program pay for me to study public health under some of the best people in the country and get a master's of business administration. And that started my journey of combining leadership and business and medicine, which I've done now for 30 years. Yeah. And uh, what do you think, what do you think triggered that back at Penn State? What to the idea of putting people together and yeah. making yeah. big things happen? Where That just couldn't fall out of the air. You, you had no. to be somewhere. Something had to trigger that. Well, I had the great pleasure of working with some other wonderful student leaders. And you might have heard of a secret society at Yale called Skull and Bones. Right. Well, there's one like that at Penn State. It's called Lion's Paw. Okay. I got I didn't into know that. that. Yeah, I got into that and worked secretly with 12 to 15 leaders, the captain of the football team, the head of the, uh, the, um, the, the paper, the head of the student government. And we all worked together for the better good of the students. And uh, I saw the power of people working together to achieve something bigger than any one person. Okay. And so you're thinking about, you thought about law, wound up in med school. Med school is a slog, isn't it? I mean, it is all, it is all consuming. In fact, I was one of the rare med students that worked to make money while I was in med school because I, money was tight despite loans and scholarships. So this is a cute story. I um, took a free university class at Penn. Free university means not for credit, just for fun. Uh Uh-huh on bartending. And I learned how to do a little bartending. The next year, I taught the bartending class. And then I <laughs> fibbed my way into a real bartending job. Said I had a little experience when I did. Yeah. So I worked for a, during med school part time as a bartender. And when people would come up to me and say, you don't look like a typical bartender. I said, no, no, I'm a doctor. <laughs> they, they never believe me. <laughs> so you get out of you know, you get your MD, you get out, you do your... Uh, I did my internal medicine training, it, then I did my public health and MD. I was 31 years old, Larry, when I was done all that stuff. Wow. That's pretty... Is that what it normally takes, or is that a... Uh, if you do track, some, uh, you do just like internal medicine or pediatrics, you might end up being 28. If you subspecialize in something like cardiology or, sur- right. you know, a special type of surgery, you're generally 30, 31. So okay. instead of being the subspecialty in medicine and becoming a cardiologist, I did this extra thing in public health. Yeah. And business. But generally well, 30, 31. It's a long road. So you get out... Right. And what do you see? What did you see? And what's happening in your mind when you get yeah. out and well, you I, know, reward now is I'm getting to my reward now? So yeah. and it was less about the reward as it was where can I apply these nascent skills? Because I yeah. still had a lot of training, but not a lot of practical experience. Right. 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 So I had this idea that turned out to be both good and bad. This was when I ended up joining an HMO called Harvard Community Health Plan. It's an organization in Boston. It's now called Harvard Pilgrim. But it was a health plan run by doctors. And back then in the late 80s, I still and we believe that health plans could be really focused on keeping people healthy. That was the idea of a health right. maintenance. Right. Yeah. Keep people healthy. Don't. And I, I was enamored with that idea and thought that this very, very fine old physician run health plan might be a place for me to get started. And Larry, they actually had a management track for young physicians to get into where you saw patients really? three quarters of the time, just like any other doctor. And in one quarter, they gave you projects under someone more experienced. So I was on a leadership track in this health plan for six years in Boston and acquired some skills and made a lot of mistakes. But I found a great mentor who took me under his wing and helped me figure out how to lead people. Yeah. And what did you learn about leading people early on that has served you well? And then maybe something you learned about leading people that really didn't go all the way. Yeah. Well, what didn't work was you don't tell 
<laughs> smart people, you never say no. Yeah. They don't tell people that are passionate yeah. about something or having a you no, that's not going to yeah. work. Yeah. So what I learned is that you try to articulate the principles or the values that are important to you. It's got to be something that helps patients. It's got to be something where we don't spend too much money. It's got to be something that's simple. You talk about the principles, and then you work with others to come on board to create solutions that fit criteria. And this yeah. was what my mentor called building the box. So you negotiate by building a box of criteria together. And then any solution that fits those criteria is a good one. But you yeah. don't argue with people. to. You don't succeed leading people by telling them what to do or arguing with them. Yeah. Did you have any, was that a tough lesson to learn or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, early on when I was at this uh, Harvard Community Health Plan, I was, you know, uh, 31, 32, 33. And a lot of the physicians I was, quote, leading were 20 years older than me. Yeah. And who was I? This young whippersnapper had all these ideas. Right. And that's where a lot of people find themselves early in their career. Yeah. But it doesn't stay that way. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But uh, I mean, there's two fundamental types of leaders. I've done a lot of studying and reading, and I've had some good mentors, as I mentioned. And there's leaders that think that they're the hero in a negative way. In other words, they have to be the smartest, the brightest, the hardest working, and everybody should listen to them because they're better than everybody else. Right. That fails all the time because yeah. people feel disempowered and they don't contribute because why should they when one person's calling all the shots? The rare second type of leader is a, a leader who's a developer who says, I want to find the best people I can and put them around me and help them work together and be successful. And right. that's the model I've tried to emulate over the years. For those of you who are sick and tired of fooling around and are dead serious about wanting to move up fast, I've got something especially for you. I've combined the best insights from over 40 years in business and making $70 million in income and compressed them into a free webinar. That's right. It's a free resource. If you want to find out exactly what the concepts are that I use in coaching million dollar earners, register now at WhiteLOnWinning.com you'll discover the five-part framework used by so many to reach their financial, personal, and professional goals. You can find that link in this episode's show notes. Well, and the thing is, Harry, I think we all have learned that have been in organizations and teams that if you're paying attention, you find... Pretty soon, your people are not interested in another Moses coming down from the mountain. No, no. It's that first ten, command, ten commandments to shove down their throat. No, but you know, unfortunately, Larry, that's still more common than not. Really, really, especially, in, in, especially in entrepreneurial organizations, yeah. young organizations. Oftentimes, yeah. the founder or the early CEO has to be so gritty and so tenacious, yeah, that they struggle to sort of empower a team. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to, well, what happens is you grow, you stagnate because you can't, you run out of hours in the day to do it all yourself. All right. so if Correct. you've got a brain, you recognize I'm going to have to delegate. And if I'm going to delegate, I've got to train them and then let them make a mistake. Like, because, I was just going to say, you got to yeah. let people make some mistakes because that's how we all learn. That's how we all learn. And you allow the mistakes inside a controlled situation with where you keep your eye on them. You don't let them. Yeah, there's guardrails to some degree, but uh, you need yeah. people to do that. And what I've been very fortunate about is I've got a number of people that have followed me in my career from job to job, from company to company, because they've enjoyed being part of my team. So I'm very proud yeah. of them. That means a lot to me. Yeah, that's like a, well, you're like, a football coach that gets a new job, an NFL thing, and takes right. all of the assistant coaches with him. <laughs> I have done that a couple of times, yes. It gives you a head start because in any situation, getting your core group of people around you is the biggest problem. And yeah. you can you get and you don't really need a huge core. You know, no. you get a few key people around you, and I'm sure you've seen that yes. uh, play really, out in the real it's world. It's only three or four key people can make all the difference. Yeah. And uh, when I moved up to North Carolina and opened up expansion operation in financial services, you know, I would get periodic updates from the founder and 
one of the things that he told me is all great revolutions are run with just a handful of people at the core. That's correct. Yeah. It's because so many things happen, you just don't have time to explain it to 40 people. Right. Uh, and so as you now get out in the real world, it, were you starting to get, after six years of leadership training, yeah. were you starting to get in that management program and everything? Like, were you starting to get a little restless where you wanted to uh, put that those skills to work? Or Yeah, well, I was in this HMO called Harvard Community Health Plan. And um, as much as I enjoyed it and learned a lot, and I got promoted a couple of times to where I ran a big medical center in downtown Boston. For those of you who know Boston, the financial district. Yeah. I saw that the idea of physician-owned HMOs were not going to be the future. It's just, it wasn't a model. You have Kaiser that's sort of like that. But other than Kaiser, there really aren't many physician-run HMOs in the country or health plans. So the next big idea I had was, well, why don't I go help start a hospital-owned health plan? So there was a network of six hospitals in all places, Kansas City, Missouri, that were building a health plan. And I got recruited out there to be the first the medical director and then the chief medical officer there. And that was not as brilliant an idea as I had hoped. I learned from that, too, because hospitals make money by having people in the beds and having the procedures done. Health plans make money by trying to avoid having people in the hospital or having a lot of procedures done. And that Uh, tension we could never resolve. So there are some hospital-owned health plans around the country. A few have succeeded, but a lot have been unsuccessful at resolving that natural tension. But I did learn a lot more in that. How long did it take you to realize that conflict? And I'm sure you tried several things to work. How long did it take you to realize that was a lost cause? I need to move on. my, My history almost invariably is to be with each organization about five to six years. This was another five year stint. Uh huh. And so, did other opportunities come, or what direction I came up to, next? I thought the best thing about managed care was this idea of disease management, trying to help diabetics stay healthier, people with asthma, kids to keep them out of the hospital by getting them on their meds, people with seniors with heart failure, which is the number one reason seniors get admitted to the hospital because their hearts are weak. Yeah. have to make sure they stay on their meds and weigh themselves every day to make sure they're not getting too much fluid in their bodies. And this was the beginning of a whole new movement called disease management. And I had the opportunity to help start a company that focused on cardiac disease. A bunch of really bright cardiologists from Johns Hopkins were founders and nurse practitioners that work directly with patients. So I, that was my first real startup. I'm thinking now uh, people who might be listening and trying to, because you obviously kept yourself moving on a good career path. What kind of barriers to entry or what kind of obstacles do people have like coming out of med school and getting started like that or getting, you know, moving into a new position that works against them being successful? You mean in the business world specifically? Real, you know, we could start with coming out of college, you know, coming out yeah. of med school and because I'm sure there's parallels. I think the what I always tell younger people today is each position you take, it doesn't matter what field you're in. Yeah. But if it's giving you an opportunity to learn and acquire some new skills and get some new perspectives, it's something to consider. But if you feel like you're not learning and you right. feel like you're stagnant, if you have the luxury of moving on, other people to, to put food on the table don't have the luxury of necessarily right. making choices. But if you have the luxury of doing different things, if you're geographically mobile, if you've got a significant other that's supportive, and I was blessed by having that, you want to be in a position where you're always learning. Because once you stop learning, you're like a shark, you know, you, you right. don't survive. Yeah. And, and to me, again, I wasn't so brilliant, Larry, that every step of my career, each of those seven jobs I planned. But I did have the focus in each job. I wanted to learn something. And then later in my career, it all kind of was accretive. It all came together. Yeah. What could you have done in those early years that maybe have allowed you to accelerate a little faster? A little faster. That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I had a great mentor early on, maybe finding another mentor later because I moved and we lost that connection. 
you know, there's a whole field of executive coaching today where if you're if you're right. in the executive world, you can find coaches that have a lot of experience working with leaders and can maybe accelerate yeah. the learning curve. I just think having good mentors and people that are help coaching you so you don't have to make so many mistakes and can try things quicker is the big key. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealanwinning.com. Thanks for listening.